Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Fitronics first quarter fiscal year 2021 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct question and answer session, and instructions will follow at that time. If anyone should require assistance during the conference, please press star, then zero on your touchtone telephone. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded Wednesday, February 24, 2021. I would now like to turn the conference over to Troy Duar, Vice President of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, Jerome. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our review of Photronics 2021 first quarter financial results. Joining me this morning are Peter Curlin, our Chief Executive Officer, John Jordan, our Chief Financial Officer, and Chris Prodler, our Chief Technology Officer. The press release we issued earlier this morning, along with the presentation material which accompanies our remarks, are available on the Investor Relations section of our webpage. I would like to note the press release had inadvertently omitted the bottom half of the balance sheet. The version on the 8K is correct, and we will be correcting the press release. Comments made by any participants on today's call may include forward-looking statements that include such words as anticipate, believe, estimate, expect, forecast, in our view. These forward-looking statements are based upon a number of risks, uncertainties, and other factors that are difficult to predict. Actual results may differ materially from those expressed or implied, and we assume no obligation to update any forward-looking information. At this time, I will turn the call over to Peter. Thank you, Troy, and good morning, everyone. We achieved sequential growth in the first quarter, defying seasonal trends that demand improve across many sectors. Most notable improvement was observed in the high-end FPD, where strong AMOLED demand for new mobile displays led the increase. High-end IC was modestly lower, with slight improvements in mainstream IC and FPD. Typical seasonality indicates that Q1 revenue would decline sequentially, so an increase of 2% demonstrates solid performance by our global team. John will offer more insights into the details shortly, but I'd like to make some general observations on what we are seeing in our market. Over the last 18 to 24 months, there have been tremendous supply chain disruptions, driven by a combination of trade policies and economic lockdowns resulting from COVID-19. In our view, these government mandates moved the market in ways that were not easily anticipated. In some cases, the impact has been positive for our industry, such as the trend to do more of what we do every day remotely, spurring demand for work from home electronics. Conversely, many automotive manufacturers suspended or severely curtailed vehicle production last spring. When automobile manufacturing recently returned to normal levels, silica capacity had shifted to work from home applications, with in effect being chip shortages. The semiconductor industry is quickly reacting to these demand dynamics, creating what we believe to be an inventory-driven semiconductor upcycle. Pending the installation of additional capacity, particularly at the high-end logic nodes, semiconductor manufacturers are focusing their resources on increasing output of needed chips and not on releasing new products. Therefore, new design activity has been constrained in what to us resembles a semiconductor industry cycle of old, where the uptime in our business flags the capital equipment suppliers by one to two quarters. Once the new tools are installed with the resultant capacity online, as inventory levels are replenished, the dam breaks and a wave of new design flows. Shifting gears to FPD, the trade policies implemented by the U.S. over the last few years have clearly impacted the electronics industry in China. Up until late last year, these policies had little impact on our business. However, that change when Huawei was placed on the denied entity list last fall. As a leading manufacturer of smartphones in China, Huawei had its own ecosystem of suppliers. When their ability to purchase leading edge semiconductors was severely constrained, it effectively froze their new product roadmap. The impact on us was a dramatic drop in demand for Photomass to build their new display panels. Fortunately, the end market demand for those phones did not disappear. 
As we move through Q1, we started to see a resurgence in new designs from alternative phone manufacturers, and recently, the very first tape out for Honor. Furthermore, significant amounts of new AMOLED display manufacturer capacity is being brought online by our customers in China this year. And moving forward, we expect a significant rise in AMOLED photo mass demand that should continue throughout 2021. Returning to our first quarter results, gross and operating margins were lower for this period. There are several reasons for this, and John will provide details during his commentary. But the bottom line is we must do better. We have positioned our operations at the high end of the market and delivering mass that are critical for the production of leading edge devices. Based on these factors, our margins need to improve. We know well what is required to accomplish this, and we are committed to deliver the results that investors as well as we expect. Moving to the bottom line, earnings per share were 13 cents. Our cash balance was steady, and our strong balance sheet continues to provide superb flexibility in managing our value creation strategy moving forward. We held our investor and analyst day in December. If you attended the live event or listened to the archive webcast, thank you for your interest and I truly hope you found the presentation helpful. If you've not yet listened, I encourage you to do so. During that event, we reviewed the commitments made during our 2018 Investor Day and how we performed against them. We also looked ahead as our investment focus evolved to maintain alignment with market trends. The two areas we highlighted were advanced display technologies and China market growth. We have three new FPD mass running tools that will be installed during 2021. These will bring us additional capacity to serve our customers who manufacture advanced panels. These investments should provide us with sequential growth in capacity and therefore revenue during the second half of 2021. As stated before, we have entered into three multi-year purchase agreements that collectively represent a business commitment in excess of $40 million annually to support these investments. We often comment that the display market is very dynamic. This includes development and adoption of new technologies. The increased penetration of AMOLED displays within smartphones is one example. As manufacturers compact, combat rather, plateauing sales by offering premium options such as upgraded displays. Similarly, the introduction of 5G requires a premium display consistent with 5G capability and feature set. The resulting transition from LTPS to AMOLED requires mass with more layers. The most basic rigid AMOLED mass set has only 12 layers, while the most advanced can have up to 25. Not only does the number of layers increase, but there are more critical layers within each set further enhancing the value we provide. Similarly, high-end technologies are expanding into the large screen TV market. We have seen the ramp of G10.5 plus form factor, which has come to dominate the production of standard LCD panels for large screen TVs. With this transition largely behind us, we are currently seeing the commercialization of various OLED displays intended to capture the premium sector of the TV market. An alternative approach combines a conventional LCD with a mini LED backlight to create a similar visual experience. These technologies are good for mass demand as they require more mass layers and more critical layers per set, creating more complexity and higher value. As a display photo mass market and technology leader, we are well positioned to benefit from these trends. Shifting to the Chinese IC market, we're in the process of qualifying the final litho, litho tool from our initial phase of investment in Xiamen. The installation of this tool was delayed six months because the supplier self-imposed travel restrictions in response to COVID-19. The tool is targeted at production of high-end photo masks. Our expectation is that it will begin to generate revenue by the end of the second quarter and ramp through the back half of the year. China remains a key region of expected growth for the semiconductor industry, 
and our presence there should position us well to grow with the market. Over the last three years, our IC revenue of product shipped to China has grown at a compounded annual growth rate of 60% and is currently running slightly above 100 million annually. We anticipate that our business there will continue to grow and we will remain the merchant foot on this market leader in China. We are off to a strong start. I would like to thank all of our employees for your good work during the first quarter. Looking forward, I continue to believe that 2021 will be one of the best years ever for Photronics as we invest to support growing end markets, expand our business and advanced display technologies, enable our global customers to meet their product roadmaps, and improve profitability and cash flow to facilitate continued investment in projects that improve our return on capital. At this time, I will turn the call over to John. Thank you, Peter. Good morning, everyone. Revenue improved 2% compared with the fourth quarter as growth in FPD was partially offset by a decline in IC. FPD growth was driven primarily by AMOLED displays for advanced smartphones. <clears throat> We've communicated over the last few quarters that the U.S. ban on Huawei had an impact on the display supply chain as design activity stopped while they reacted to the new restrictions. This affected our fourth quarter FPD results as panel suppliers did not require new masks for Huawei phones. During the first quarter, we saw this disruption ease and AMOLED demand return as new phones produced by other manufacturers made their way to the consumer. Elsewhere in FPD, demand for LCD masks, including G10.5 Plus, remained depressed as panel producers took advantage of favorable market dynamics by maximizing output of current product and not releasing new panels. IC revenue is down slightly compared with the previous quarter as an increase in mainstream and memory growth was offset by reduced high-end logic demand, partially due to the industry dynamics Peter mentioned earlier. In addition, one of our high-end writing tools in Taiwan was down for an extended period as travel restrictions delayed the repair and return to production. On a year-over-year -year basis, many of the trends we saw were similar to the sequential trends with a larger decline in high-end logic and a smaller increase in smartphone, smartphone displays. Looking forward, there's a plethora of positive data points for our industries that suggest photo mass demand should increase in 2021. That combined with the additional capacity we plan, plan to bring online during the second half of the year gives us confidence in our outlook for 2021 of high single digit percentage revenue growth and operating profit growth similar to the 23% growth we achieved in 2020. Gross profit for Q1 was 20% lower than the previous quarter and previous year, driven primarily by unfavorable product mix, which we expect to improve as high-end logic demand returns. Operating expenses were higher sequentially, which is not unusual for the first quarter, and within our expectations as a percentage of revenue. Below the operating income line, net effects of other income, tax provision, and non-controlling interests were more favorable than comparable periods, resulting in earnings per diluted share of 13 cents for the period. Our cash balance at the end of the first quarter was $279 million, essentially unchanged from the beginning of the quarter. Operating cash flow was $26 million, and we spent $18 million on CapEx. For full fiscal year 2021, we're still forecasting approximately $100 million in CapEx as we execute on the next phase of FPD capital investment. We repurchased 1.2 million shares of our common stock for $13 million during the quarter, leaving approximately $69 million remaining under our current share repurchase authorization. On the balance sheet, Total debt increased by a net of $33 million, which includes a new equipment lease. 
Before I provide second quarter guidance, I'll remind you that our visibility is always limited as our backlog is typically only one to three weeks. And demand for some of our products is inherently uneven and difficult to predict. Additionally, the ASPs for high-end mask sets are high. And as this segment of the business grows, a relatively low number of high-end orders can have a significant impact on our quarterly revenue and earnings. Geopolitical risk related to government actions to address health concerns and trade policy may have an impact on our operations, the operations of our customers or suppliers, or end market demand, resulting in an adverse impact on our industry and therefore our results. Given those caveats, we expect second quarter revenue to be in the range of $153 to $162 million. We are encouraged by demand trends in our markets and overall positive commentary by others in the industry. High-end logic recovery is anticipated, but timing is uncertain. Other markets should continue to grow, and we're on track to deliver on 2021 targets. Based on our revenue expectation and our current operating model, we estimate earnings for the second quarter to be in the range of 14 to 20 cents per diluted share. We have begun 2021 on an encouraging note, growing revenue in a seasonally soft period and meeting supply chain challenges. We are pleased with our performance, but there is room for improvement. Margins should improve as we grow revenue, further benefiting from fixed cost absorption and continued focus on removing costs from our supply chain and operations. During our investor day in December, we presented our three-year target model that establishes operating margins in the high teens, earnings in excess of a dollar a share, and free cash flow of approximately $100 million. We're confident that these targets are achievable and look forward to updating you as we move forward. I will now turn the call over to the operator for your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have questions at this time, please press star, then the number one key on your touchstone telephone. If your question has been answered or you wish to remove yourself from the queue, please press the pound key. Your first question comes from the line of Tom DeFelli with D.A. Davidson. Can we now ask your question? Yeah, good morning. Um, I guess I first wanted just to look into the um, mainstream market for you. Obviously, it's still a big part of your revenue. What are you seeing as far as industry capacity, uh, and what are the pricing trends and growth trends you see there? Yeah, our, our mainstream uh, – uh, mainstream, the mainstream market right now, uh, you know, particularly uh, in Asia, for us is very strong. So the, our capacity in Korea, you know, Taiwan, and China, it was sold out uh, in the uh, in the current quarter. U.S. and Europe, uh, you know, not, but throughout Asia, we're in an oversold. Uh, situation, and if you look relative to, you know, historical uh, uh, behavior, probably the first time in my 35 years, uh, anyways, where I see or we see uh, significant investment being made in legacy nodes. Never seen that uh, before. So the market is you know, oversold for photo masks, and there's more capacity uh, coming online. So this also, you know, sets the stage to, you know, do things that we have effectively never been able to do in the mainstream, which is to start to, uh, you know, nibble at, you know, raising prices. So we're in a dynamic now where, uh, we expect to see um, we expect to see pricing, you know, uh, move up instead of down, you know, in the mainstream, you know, market segment, and that should 
start to happen in the current quarter, and uh, as we step through the year, uh, we'll see how far uh, we can take that. Won't have a big impact on revenue necessarily, but will have a disproportionate effect on profitability. So obviously okay, we, great, Matt. yeah, obviously we like that trend, right? We like we we like that trend. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, yeah we like that trend. Yeah. Okay. Um, great. Thanks, Peter. And, and uh, maybe as a follow-up, uh, you talked about forty million dollars of annual contracts right now with a, a few large uh, flat panel customers. When you look at phase two, do you typically get into those contracts ahead of time, um, and so they're kind of in place for when you spend the money to put in another line, or what are the dynamics there for a new line going in? Yeah, it's a mix. Uh, it's a mix of the two. Um, you know, as far as IFPD business is concerned, just you know, remind you know, re- remind you that for a couple years running, uh, we were uh, sold out in our FPD business. Q4 on the Q3 call, we said we expected Q4 not to be sold out, which uh, was for us, you know, a dislocation. And indeed, it happened as we expected it, it, it would. Then well, we got on the Q4 call, and then our analyst day, a day or two later, what we said was November, you know, was, you know, a month of, you know, still a month of grim, you know, uh, market. And that December, by the time we had those calls, we were able to sell our capacity. And that, that obviously continued through the quarter. So our FPD revenues this quarter, you know, reflect one month of, you know, kind of crappy market and two months not of a, what I would describe as a strong market, but strong for us because of our position, particularly in AMOLED. So um, if we project forward, you know, as I said, you know, we expect a lot of, you know, AMOLED capacity uh, to come online, uh, particularly in China, right? We estimate for our customers a doubling, more or less, from the beginning of the year to the end. And we're, you know, bringing this capacity online right into the midst of that uh, capacity ramp, which the service, I think, you know, very well. So what we, the tools are, so if you look at our AMOLED, there's three litho tools. You know, two are, two are slated to be delivered in the current quarter. Because of the short qualification cycles, we expect to ramp both of those tools in the third quarter. By the fourth quarter, they should be fully sold out. You know, we'll, we'll so basically, we think as soon as we can get them online, they're going to be sold out. Um, the third tool is being installed in the third quarter, so uh, by should be ramping into the fourth quarter. So anyways, um, the AMOLED capacity we're installing uh, this year, as soon as it comes online, uh, we believe we should be able to uh, fill it. And the entire factory for the rest of the year, we believe, uh, should be, you know, fully sold. So uh, we're feeling good about, you know, AMOLED and what should constrain our revenues is our ability to install and ramp those new tools, right? So, okay, great. And, yeah, and unlike, you know, you know, John made some remarks. If you look at our global cost structure, right, the capacity additions we're making this year are more or less point tools, not lines. So point tool installations have, you know, more financial leverage than when we have to do what we just did in China, right, uh, which is uh, build factories and install lines that where the line share, the CapEx there is not fully utilized. So the second wave in, uh, in Herfe should, you know, help us, you know, effectively, you know, grow into and fully leverage our cost structure there. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, maybe if I could just squeeze one more in for John. 
when you look at the single digit revenue growth, but the 23% or so um, you know, operating uh, leverage, uh, is that just kind of normal operating leverage for you, or is it um, or some special things going on this year that creates a little bit higher leverage than you would normally see? No, Tom, we, we should see um, OPEX improve as a percentage of revenue through the year. First quarter is generally uh, kind of tough on with OPEX, with uh, um, employer taxes, et cetera, uh, re reinstating. And then with our regular, our normal operating leverage through the rest of the year, we should be uh, pretty comfortably within the range that we uh, discussed, the 20, mid, low to mid 20%. So the increase of these new tools doesn't uh, ramp up your COGS meaningfully? Well, we, you know, we only uh, start depreciation as we qualify and start generating revenue from those tools. So we we have a fairly close match of uh, depreciation with revenue, and it's a it's a, a smaller portion of the uh, depreciation coming on. So our operating leverage will still uh, be 50 percent uh, or better. Great. Okay. Well, thanks for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Tom. Your next question comes from the line of Patrick Cole, Red Stiffel. Can we don't ask her a question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Peter, maybe first off, in, in terms of the high-end, uh, um, excuse me, high-end IC business that you talk about recovering, are you seeing it, uh, where are you seeing it in specific markets of this potential recovery? And could it be a steep ramp uh, when it does finally recover? Yeah. So, it's, you know, yeah. You know, it, you know, Patrick, great. I think you know that we have a really uh, strong global team that react that has reacted and does historically and continues to react very quickly to shifts in markets. Um, and likewise, it's a very seasoned uh, team. So, if we look at our memory business, for example, you know, John commented on it. It snapped back just like you would expect in a normal upturn. So, boom, you know, memory business. You know, full on. So traditional. Logic business, you know, different story. Right? We've talked about the mainstream where over the last two to three years and over the next certainly one to two years, we see uh, new capacity, you know, coming online. So the mainstream market uh, is oversold like I've never seen. 35 years oversold and likely stay that way. On the other hand, if you look at the high end logic, I think as you, you know well, right, there's there's a problem there, not for our, our customers, but for their customers because there's a shortage of high end logic capacity. I think that now is, you know, well understood. So the capital equipment guys, right, are selling a fistful of tools, right? I think we had, you know, we had bookings of three billion, right, in a month in January. I don't think that's ever happened before. And those tools, you know, are largely, you know, many of them being installed in, you know, the Asian foundries, which right now are, you know, running the you know, current designs in general, quite hard, you know, trying to keep their customers, you know, happy. So, yeah, if you look at how the high-end logic market is behaving, it looks like, to me, the kind of cycles I saw 15 years ago where, you know, the business would turn up, right, the customers would, you know, react to the upturn of business by building current products, and then as they added capacity, we would see a significant uplift in our business because now, you know, inventory is starting to build a little. People are more comfortable. The new designs that, you know, they kept on the shelf for, you know, a quarter or so, you know, break out. That's, that's what the whole business, when it was more diversified with many more manufacturers, looked like. Fifteen years ago, that was a classic cycle for the entirety of our business. 
we see that classic cycle now. We haven't seen it for you know at least 10 years, but we see it now in the high-end logic sector. The designs, they're sitting there. They're going to get released. And they're going to get released when you know our customers are doing a better job of keeping their customers you know happy. So yeah, that will be likely a steeper step up and it'll be reminiscent of you know the days of old. So what we see this year is every quarter successively being you know a better quarter. That's what we see both in our FPD and our IC businesses. That's what we you know that's what we said during you know our analyst say that's what we said on the last call. And the only thing that's happened really to change our view between then and now is you know, the, inf the information flow is incrementally more positive. So, um, yeah, it's an interesting time, right, with markets doing and behaving in different ways. But if you look back over many years, each market you look at, you can see uh, the reasons for why what is happening is happening. So it's an interesting, fluid, you know, time, but there's lots of opportunity you know, there, I think, uh, for us uh, quarter by quarter. And the capacity we have coming online, um, you know, when we, brought it, when we made the purchase decisions, you know, it wasn't you know, completely clear what was going to happen. But generally, I think we have the right pieces on the board in the right places to, you know, maximize the financial outcome of the current trends in the various markets we participate in. So we're feeling you know, pretty, you know, pretty good about, uh, uh, the, about the business and about the markets uh, this year for sure. Yep. Great. That's helpful, Peter. Maybe as a follow-up question, uh, you talked about the strength in the, the mainstream IC business, which, uh, again, it's not a major surprise given the, the market environment we're in today. Uh, maybe uh, related to some of the comments you made about uh, high-end ICs and how, uh, you know, historically it's been driven by new design wins. Aside from the strong demand and the need for new masks to keep up with, uh, again, the demand trends out there, are you seeing any new designs on the mainstream IC? And what I'm trying to get at that is we're seeing more silicon content in markets like automotive, uh, there are also, uh, you know, other types of, uh, again, silicon content increases in, in different marketplaces. Are, are you seeing any design wins on the mainstream IC side? Yeah, that, that, you know, uh, the, the, you know, the answer is yes, right? So I think most, nearly all the automotive applications are not High end, or at least the way we define high end is 28 nanometer and below. The automotive applications, the high end of automotive, you know, might touch, right, the 28 nanometer node, but in general, uh, it's an uh, older, what we would call older, uh, uh, older nodes. So, you know, this is a market where historically, when you saw an upturn, the business would get better, but there wouldn't be new capacity coming online. I think it's very clear, right, that now and for the last year or two, there's been there are investments being made in new mainstream fats. And those investments are being, you know, um, driven by increased demand at those nodes, not just for the existing products, but for new ones. And I think the point you made, right, a new car, I think today has $800 of silicon content in it on average. And if you go to a high-end car, it's much more. And as we go shift from the internal combustion engine to you know, the hybrid and electrification model, there's going to be a boatload. Power electronics, that's all mainstream, all. I mean, some of the, the, some of the, some of the chips, you know, or, or, you know, or an in, a couple inches in diameter, right, for the switching electronics. So, you know, this, what's going on in the automobile industry is, um, 
is going to create dislocations in our industry that you know we 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 I don't think any of us have ever seen. So um, and you can see the capex uh, being adjusted, you know, to um, uh, you know, in advance of it. So um, yeah, this is uh, it's, it's interesting times. All right, your next question. All right, again, ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question at this time, please press par, then the number one key on your touchstone telephone. If your question has been answered or you wish to remove yourself from the queue, please press the pound key. Your next question comes from the line of God Richard with Northland. You may now ask your question. Yes, thanks for taking the question. Um, just in terms of the gross margin in the uh, first quarter, it was down to 130 uh, bips sequentially, um, and you had some tools down, and it was a weaker mix. Could you parse those out and just give us uh, a little bit of uh, guidance as to which was the bigger impact or, or the mix between those impacts? Yeah, I don't know that we would we'd say one is bigger than the other. We had, uh, you know, the... Uh, a decline in the high end IC, which, and we had a slide uh, kind of lower geometry product up to uh, higher level machines, and then in uh, FPD we had uh, you know some unabsorbed overhead. So I, I don't know that I'd weigh one effect on the margin more than the other. Okay, and then um, in terms of uh, it, it sounded like some of your competitors are adding. Um, capacity for uh, mature markets, um, given most of the equipment in the market is is fully depreciated, can those new assets um, be competitive at current prices and be profitable? No, I mean I think I think what so you know to you know, just go back and you know clarify one of John's comments. So we saw a high end logic demand weak. So what we did is we and mainstream demand very strong. So what we did was we split we basically split our capacity where we took um, basically we kind of moved everything a tool up to keep to do our best to try to maximize our market share. As the high end demand resumes we'll push that all back down. You can see the effect on our margins, right? And the, Anyone who tries to do the same thing is going to have the same outcome, right? To the extent you use, you know, a more expensive tools to bring build lower ASP product, your margins are going to get compressed. And today, it's not feasible to buy a new mainstream line and have it make money at current pricing. It's not feasible. But what the industry will do is what you know we are doing and what we planned for last year, and that is. If you look at our maintenance capex, it's largely targeted at the mainstream market, and it's there to de-bottleneck, you know, the lines that we existing lines that we have. So we can get a little, you know, financially viable capacity uplift in the mainstream by putting, a, you know, putting the right tools in the right location. But you know, what can we squeeze out? I don't know, another 10%, maybe 15 about and then we're done you know and uh, I think our competitors are in a very similar situation they can do what we're doing at a point tool to align gain incrementally more capacity but then they're going to be done so um, and, and the consequence of that I think uh, which I think you've highlighted is prices have to go up and they'll go up until you can add new capacity and make money, right? How much that is, I don't think we've, we've run models, but it's, it's, it's not small. Got it, got it. So what, what you're painting a picture of is as the high end fills up in the back half and designs are released, you're going you're gonna to see a significant uh, uplift in utilization um, in in the both mature and 
high end and it and prices should go up and this should be a very favorable trend for margins walking through the year yes you basically um will be we'll slide you know the the mainstream business down off the high end tools and refill those tools with the high end logic in asia that's one trend another trend is you know, it's undeniable that prices will start to are starting. In fact, we started after Chinese New Year uh, with select customers, uh, where they're you know, to start to raise mainstream pricing. You know, I've been doing this for 35 years. I've never been able to do that before. So, but and I we can do it. <laughs> we can do that because everybody is sold out. Everybody, not just Photronics. Everybody. Got it. And then uh, yeah. last question, um, climate change. Um, you know, there was this cold snap in uh, Texas, uh, a lot of water damage, power out, et cetera, et cetera. I think you have a plant in Round Rock. Um, and I was just wondering, was that plant impacted? Um, you know, is it back up and running? Just any any color there? Yeah. So, yeah, both we and our uh, largest competitor have, you know, factories in Texas, and uh, we were both impacted. Their factory was down for a week. Our factory was down. We were offline based on, based on loss of power for about a day, and the impact of that loss of power more or less uh, depressed, you know, output for the best part of a week, so we lost about half of our output uh, in the as a result of uh, uh, the dislocation in the power grid. So on one hand, we're happy we outperformed our competitor who was down hard the entire period. On the other, it, you know, it, it did have a impact on uh, our revenues, and that's already been baked into the guidance. Uh, so there's no, nothing, nothing that we know of, you know, beyond that uh, that uh, you don't already you know, see the financial consequences of. So, um, yeah, wasn't it wasn't a good wasn't good for us. It was worse for our competitor. Of course, we have several uh, significant customers in Texas, in particular NXP, which was the old Freescale, which was the old Motorola and Samsung, both uh, both and also Infineon, uh, all three offline for basically for a solid week, and now trying to recover. Uh, production. Got it. And then well, we the better. last one you... We did better. We did better than all, <laughs> but uh, we were still affected. Yeah. Yeah. And then just the last one for me, um, you know, you've had some issues getting, um, you know, things installed, repaired um, because of quarantine and COVID. Um, are those issues behind you at this point, or are you still, um, you know, struggling to get, you know, vendors in to do stuff? Yeah, so uh, the problems with installations we, you know, you know hope are uh, behind us. Uh, you know, different, uh, uh, but, but uh, yeah, we, we think the installation issues are behind us because uh, there's kind of one category of vendor that has struggled more than, you know, uh, others regarding uh, uh, COVID. We're still going to have, uh, you know, I think some issues related to uh, the inability, uh, the, the travel constraints imposed by COVID, because not every uh, vendor for the photo mask industry has fully capable people in all the regions where we operate. So um, this is going to be a kind of a nagging headache for another quarter or two, but as uh, we're already seeing with infection rates dropping, as the vaccination uh, cross-section of the countries we do business in uh, increases, the problems we've been fighting for for us, right? It started in Herfe, uh more than a year ago. We've been fighting with these struggles for a year. I think we've done uh, a very good job at mitigating uh, the impact, but uh, 
we kind of see a tail that'll last another you know quarter or two. So, and the good news is is that you know that high end, it's a 9K in Jamen. That's a very high end uh, e beam, right? That was delayed. You know, it, it was the installation, the final acceptance of that tool was uh, uh, the end of where well, it was beginning. It was the end of October, the last day of October. So we've been working to qualify that tool, and as uh, the qualification period is completed, it should, you know, ramp right into what we think is the ramp in the high-end logic market. Now, that might be lucky, I don't know, but the tool was always intended uh, for Jamin, and, you know, the rest of the costs that are needed, needed to support that tool is already, you know, dragging our income statement. And once that tool is installed, the leverage of it financially should be high, right? So, uh, anyways, uh, the fact that it was delayed isn't the worst thing in the world, given, you know, the softness in the high-end logic market we're presently seeing. So, uh, you know, maybe we got lucky on that one. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Okay. Thanks so much. Ladies and gentlemen, there are no further questions at this time. I will now turn the call over to Peter Curlin for closing comments. Thank you for taking the time to join us this morning. We truly appreciate your interest. Vitronics is well positioned to grow revenue, earnings, and cash flow this year, extending our market and technology leadership positions and moving us towards our long-term financial target. Look forward to updating you on our success as the year progresses. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the conference call for today. We thank you for your participation and ask that you please.